Say again. You may begin. Good day. I'm Jeff Shepard, your host for today's Nixon Legacy Forum, co-sponsored by the National Archives and the Richard Nixon Foundation. We've done over three dozen of these legacy forums since 2010. They feature former members of the Nixon administration discussing various public policy initiatives undertaken by our 37th president. The former National Archivist, David Ferriero, was very supportive of these forums, introducing many of them and enthusing about how they made the documents come alive. Today's focus is on the establishment of the Domestic Council and the Office of Management and Budget by Reorganization Plan Number 2 of 1970. This triggered a change from what has been characterized as cabinet government where cabinet members largely determined the direction of their respective departments and the president focused on a handful of important issues to one where the president and his immediate staff are in a position to make most policy determinations which cabinet departments are then expected to effectuate. In essence, this better enables the president with about a thousand Senate confirmed appointments to set priorities and give direction to the vast executive branch of our government. It's not a perfect system, but the systems put into place back in 1970 largely remain in place today. To help tell our story, we have five former members of President Nixon's staff. I'm going to introduce each of them <coughs> and, and then ask each <coughs> to tell us how they ended up at the Nixon White House. And if our AV team will show the first PowerPoint slide, we'll go from there. So first to arrive is Ed Harper. Ed, tell us how you got there. It's a complicated story, but briefly, I was a graduate student at the University of Virginia. Then I taught at Rutgers for two years and uh, decided to take, an adv take advantage of the National Academy of Public Administration's graduate program where we would work in government for a year. And uh, I was recruited by Andrew Rouse, whose name you'll hear again later in this program, to work for him in the Bureau of the Budget. And uh, Andy went on, as he'll be introduced subsequently. And uh, I, my work uh, brought me to the attention of John Ehrlichman. We had lunch. John said, what do you know about the Appalachian Regional Commission? And I told him what I knew about it. And he said, you're hired. When can you start? And I said, Monday. So you were in on uh, uh, basically John Ehrlichman's staff as, as counsel to the president before the domestic council came into effect. Then you were on the domestic council itself. And then you returned to government under uh, President Reagan and you headed the domestic council, and at the same time, if I understand it, you were Senate confirmed as deputy director of OMB. So you yes. were present at the creation, and then you circled back. I was glad to be back and gave well, me good for you. Pursue the things. next to arrive is Bobby Kilbert. Bobby, how did you get there? Hi. Well, um, my husband and I together became White House fellows right out of law school uh, in August of 1969. And I was assigned to Ken Cole, who was the White House staff secretary. And Ken and Ken reported to John Ehrlichman as counsel to the president. And they all they shared a, su a suite of offices on the second floor of the West Wing. And over time, I just kind of migrated to John. And John kind of um, adopted me. And I still work for Ken, but I reported directly to John. And that kind of evolved. You're technically assigned to the staff secretary. Correct. But John's doing many of those functions. Correct. And supervising. And we should point out, you were Bobby Green when you <laughs> for a while. Yes, fellow. I was till September yes, you were. 1970. Yeah. You dragged Bill along with you, <laughs> and, and Bill came at the same time, uh, but didn't make the didn't make the White House staff. Bill, where were you? Didn't apply to the White House staff. I was uh, like Bobby. I was appointed a White House fellow in 
the fall of 1969. Uh, and I went to work for George Schultz, who was Secretary of Labor at the time, and then stayed in and around the Department of Labor. I was uh, General Counsel of the Federal Mediation and Conciliation Service for a year, uh, 1970-71, then was recruited to come back to the Labor Department as Associate Solicitor of Labor for Labor Relations and Civil Rights. Uh, did that from 1971 to 1973, when the president appointed me solicitor or general counsel of the U.S. Department of Labor, and I served in that capacity from uh, April of 1973 until January of 1977. So Bill is our current living expert on George Schultz, and we'll get back to him directly. Uh, I was next to arrive. I was a White House fellow in the same class as Bobby and Bill. But I was assigned uh, to Treasury for my fellowship year. And then at the end of the fellowship year, it was a chance conversation uh, with John Ehrlichman. We had earlier discussed uh, Seattle law firms, where John came from. And he asked me if I, at the end of my year, I was going to go back to Seattle. And, and I still can't believe I said this, but I, I said, well, you know, uh, I'd really like to get a job on the White House staff, but I don't even know how to apply. <laughs> and, and I didn't know John had just been named head of the domestic council and had 30 slots paid for and everything. He said, oh, that's simple. You come see me. And and eventually I, I did. And I, I so I, I think of myself as the first outside hire onto the newly established domestic council. And shortly after my arrival came Jim Cavanaugh. Jim, how did you get there? Jeff, I was assistant secretary for health at Scientific Affairs at the, what was then the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare, sitting in the secretary's office, it was Elliot Richardson on a Friday evening talking about some legislation we were having trouble getting through the Senate committee, uh, chaired at the time, as I recall, a ranking member, Peter Dominic from Colorado. And the phone rang and Elliot took the phone and uh, talked and nodded his head and said yes, and yes, and yes, and yes. I think I've got an answer for you, Jim Cavanaugh. <laughs> There's another pause. He said, eight o'clock tomorrow morning. He said, Saturday. And, and Elliot said, all right, I'll talk to him. It's up to him, but uh, I'll talk to him. And with that, Elliot hung up and said, well, I've got a assignment for you if you want to take it. And I said, what's that? He said, you have to be at the West Wing of the White House at eight o'clock tomorrow morning, Saturday and asked for Ken Cole, he'll be expecting you. And I said, Ken Cole works for, and he said, John Ehrlichman, da 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 I certainly knew the name, and I said, all right, um, I'll be there. Any idea what he wants to talk about? He said, well, yeah. He said, uh, John Ehrlichman uh, uh, came to talk to Ken and said, you know, Ken, I'm a Christian scientist, so is Bob Halderman. Uh, we've both decided that we're going to uh, uh, get ourselves out of the health policy business, and you're it. You report directly to the president on health policy, and uh, that's what Ken once talked to you about. So I went over at 8 o'clock next morning, saw Ken. Um, we had a great talk, he asked me about my background in health policy, told me that the president was interested in developing a national health insurance policy program, and he Ken wanted my help, and would I be willing to do it? And I said, sure. And he said, I've got to unplug myself from what I'm doing over at HEW. And Ken said, well, that won't be a problem. I'll call Elliot and take care of that. And I said, how long an assignment do you think it'll be? And he said, well, it's a complicated thing, so it may take you a week or two or three. <laughs> I, said, well, I, I said, when would you like me to start? And he said, how about Monday morning? And I said, fine. He said, great. He put his hand across the desk and said, you're on. And uh, he said, come with me. So he got up from his office on the second floor of the West Wing, took the elevator down to the ground floor, walked across West Executive Avenue, walked into the executive office building and said, I've got to find an office for you. And we took an elevator up to the first floor and walked a couple of feet down the corner. And he said, this office right here, it's kind of small, but you won't need a lot of room and you're not going to be here very long. So how's this? And I said, it looks fine. He said, just for your information, it's sort of the cross hall of the, the uh, executive office building. Right across the call, county corner is the president's hideaway office. I said, all right, I'll be here at 8 o'clock Monday morning. So 
that was the start. And then uh, your 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 TDY of two or three weeks turned into uh, staying through the entire Nixon administration and then becoming deputy chief of staff uh, for the Ford administration. Correct. So you uh, you you uh, either you didn't get your work done or you you hung on quite a while. Well, I was, uh, you know, it was a complicated issue, Jeff. <laughs> yes, it certainly was. Now, I should add, uh, as, as we're going to go back to full screen, if the AV people will take us back to full screen, um, the, the four of us, Bobby and, and Bill and, and Jim and I, were, uh, well, Bobby, Bill and I are all currently board members of the Nixon Foundation, and Jim just retired as chairman. So the only person not uh, uh, currently on the Nixon Foundation or immediately passed uh, is Ed Harper, but he, he lives in Florida and can, can be forgiven for that. But Ed, Ed played such a, such a significant role in putting it all together. Now, if you will recall, uh, when Ed was explaining how he got there, he mentioned the name of Andy Rouse. Uh, Andy was uh, at the Bureau of the Budget and then worked for the uh, consulting uh, firm uh, uh, Arthur D. Little? Correct. Okay. And then brought back in uh, to help with executive organization, and he became the deputy of the Ash Council, and then ultimately became uh, the full-time executive director of the Ash Council. The Ash Council uh, was established early in the administration, uh, to help reorganize and rationalize this burgeoning executive branch. Uh, and if we go back to uh, the next PowerPoint slide, if the AV folks will take us back, uh, we will see the members. This is the President's Advisory Council on Executive Organization. Uh, and it was headed by Roy Ash of Lenton Industries. That's why it's called the Ash Council. But also members were John Connolly, who was four times governor of Texas as a Democrat. This is how Nixon met Connolly. Frederick Kappel, who was chairman of AT&T. Dick Padgett, who was founder of Crescent McCormick and Padgett, uh, a, a very, very prominent consulting firm. George Baker, who was dean of Harvard Business School. And a gentleman named Walter Thayer, who had been past president of the New York Herald Tribune. This was a heavy group of people, and their job was to help rationalize the organization and management of, of the executive branch. If we go to the next slide, AV, go to the next slide. There, the executive directors were Murray Camaro and Andy Rouse, but Andy was deputy and then executive director. So he was there throughout. There is no Ash Council report uh, as a single entity. There's a series of 14 different recommendations. And I gave you the, the, the uh, site here. You can get it right off the National Archives. Uh, but they're responsible for the creation of the Office of Telecommunications Policy, the creation of the Domestic Council and OMB, and then the creation of the Environmental Protection Agency and the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. And you can read their various memos on rationalizing the organization. Uh, the one we're most concerned with today is dated October 17th of 1969, and it discusses how the president deserves the ability to influence the policies throughout the executive branch, and they suggest the creation of what they call the Office of Executive Management and the creation of the Domestic Policy Council. In all of their memos, those are the two names they use and they justify it. They met with the president in August of 1969. Uh, we thought we would have Andy with us today, uh, but he's 94. Uh, he remains a dear friend, but he said he just couldn't do this program. So I'm, uh, I'm parroting Andy's words. They met with Nixon out at San Clemente on August 20th uh, and, and pitched him on their ideas. He gave tentative approval 
So they submitted this far more formal menu on, memo on October 17th, and that mutated into a presidential message to the Congress, uh, 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 dated May. I have it here in my, uh, my, my pages. I have all the paperwork. March 12th, 1970 was a formal admission uh, submission to the Congress of Reorganization Plan Number 2 of 1970. And at this point, the Domestic Policy Council was formerly named the Domestic Council. And I'm told it's because the National Security Council, its counterpart, didn't have the word policy in the name and they wanted to parallel that. So the National Security Council was created in 1947 and consisted of Secretary of State and Defense and the CIA and the Treasury. The Domestic Council consisted of the entire cabinet except state and defense and the post office. Now, they never meet as, as a whole. They would work on particular issues in cabinet committees. And while we talk about the domestic council, most of the work was done by the staff, the domestic council staff uh, that supervised the assimilation of, uh, of, of policy recommendations and the submission of policy papers uh, uh, to, to the president. The organization plan went through, the Bureau of the Budget became the Office of Management and Budget, the Domestic Council was created out of whole cloth, uh, and what we're going to do in turn is talk about each of those, uh, but we're going to go now to the next slide, uh, which is on the Domestic Council, and we're going to leave that up for a minute, and Ed Harper was actually there and got a running start on this because uh, he was doing Domestic Council work in June confident it would come into effect on July 1st. Ed, do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yes, I'd be happy to. That uh, The nascent domestic council was pretty much in place uh, before the legislation was finished. And so uh, under John's uh, leadership, we developed a series of position papers, and in fact, a whole presentation which uh, John and I gave to the president in San Clemente. And it was paired with a presentation uh, by Henry Kissinger and the National Security Council staff. They went first, took up about a day with their presentation. We went second and spent a day talking about the domestic issues and what our recommendations were, John Ehrlichman and the Domestic Council's recommendations were for the president's priorities for the coming year. And in fact, uh, these priorities pretty much held up as the agenda, the domestic agenda for the Nixon administration in its first term. Uh, so I think that in, in many ways, this was the realization of the model that John Ehrlichman and the president had hoped to create. Now, let, me, let me just let, let me interrupt for a minute because I want to dispose of this slide. We show you on the slide the technical leadership for under Nixon and Ford, but we're really only going to talk about two people who were so key at the beginning, John Ehrlichman, who is the original director, and Ken Cole. Uh, Ken is shown down at the bottom as being deputy director, and then ultimately he succeeds Mel Laird uh, uh, as, uh, 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 as actual director. But Laird was pretty much a, a, a figurehead, uh, and the real work, the seminal work, was done by John and Ken. I think all of us remember uh, uh, how, how the leadership keyed off of John. Uh, and I, I, I'd like to switch. I mean, the Domestic Council was hugely influential, and we'll see in a minute that the folks at OMB were more public and, 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 and in more uh, visible positions 
but the domestic council staff was staffing the presidency itself, the president, and and they were they, they were in the background. Their job was was to offer up to the president the policy choices and the rationales. So we'll switch to Bobby and ask Bobby to discuss John Ehrlichman's management of style, the the way it ran in the beginning, if you would, because you were you were working for John even before the domestic council. Yes, I was. And <clears throat> of interest to me is that this, the uh, consolidation and the formalization of a domestic policy staff was very important, but I always wonder what it would have been like if John had not been the executive director because people and personnel and personal relationships are everything. And John had the confidence of the president. So even before there was a domestic policy council, John was in charge. There was no question about that. John was the one who determined with the president, obviously, under the president's leadership, what the priorities were and how we were about to um, put them into play in the sense of defining them more than just simply an idea or an initiative. How would it actually work? And I will always remember that we had something called memorandum uh, for the president. And when back in those days, we had... Um, What's, what do you call the paper when you um, when you write something and white it comes paper. out underneath? A white Pardon? paper? Yeah, it's no, white papers, but they were it's papers like that random. were literally um, <laughs> papers that were literally had carbon copies. That's what it is, right. was carbon copies. And every memorandum on a domestic policy issue would be eventually entitled Memorandum to the President for the president, but before we go to the president, it would go through a very elaborate system. Again, starting when I, before I even got there, which was August, 1969. And a number of those memorandum to the president were sent back by John before they ever reached the president because he felt that they hadn't been properly vetted by the cabinet departments or that the cabinet members had not had their adequate say. And so I would send them back and tell the cabinet member, you have till X, Y, or Z time to put in your input as to what you think about this initiative and whether you agree or disagree. And John was exceptionally good in the memorandum to the president that eventually went in under his signature to have the views of everybody with an interest in that subject matter represented. And also with, you know, agreed or disagree. And so the head of HEW could disagree with the head of HUD. And that would all be reflected in the memo so that when the president saw it, he knew where every relevant member of his cabinet was on any particular topic. And, and so there weren't any surprises. If I, if I could add, this paralleled the way the National Security Council operated. They had two... Right sorts of memos, National Security Study Memorandum and mm -hmm. National Security Decision Memorandum. And it was uh, uh, when, when Nixon first got together with Kissinger, he said, I want a National Security Council that runs like Eisenhower's. So let me introduce you to General Goodpaster and describe the way it was done when I was vice president. <clears throat> and what they would do the foreign affairs decisions were made on paper. There was none of this personal pitch. And the memos consisted of four parts. What's the issue? Why do we have to decide? What are the president's options? Correct. And what do people think that the president respects think about these options? And that where, where Bobby said, you know, HEW could, could disagree with HUD, but the issue that John was pioneering on the domestic side was being sure everybody was heard fairly, but in writing. Correct. Nixon had sat through all these meetings of the Urban Affairs Council. When I wasn't going to do it Moynihan again. And, and uh, Arthur Burns were debating all kinds of stuff, but no decisions were made because they couldn't agree on nomenclature or options. And John John came up with this wonderful idea. Why don't we do it in writing? That's what Nixon preferred anyway. So, Correct. Bobby, you're saying he was doing that before. Oh, he was the doing it council. before the Domestic Policy Council existed. He was doing it from the very beginning. And initially, the emails or the memorandums would be memorandum for John Ehrlichman. And John, 
a lot of that was on paper as well, though there were committees that met throughout the cabinets and throughout the departments on topics. But it would often be back from John to the cabinet members saying, okay, one last shot, what do you think? Or I need this more vetted out, or I need this more thoughtful, more of a thoughtful response. And the other part of it was that under each of those four sections you described, the president was asked to approve, disapprove, see me. And you'd have, you get emails back from, or memory copy the, um, the, not the Xerox, but the, the carbon paper copy back, which would say signed by RN approved, RN disapproved, RN see me. And that was for each of the specific subsets of the topic that you were making a decision on and we were making a decision on. So you then had follow-up emails from um, to the president saying, okay, this is a topic that you did not like an answer for, <clears throat> or you wanted to have a better discussion. Here are some more options. So John actually was very inclusive of his cabinet. And I jokingly say his cabinet, because in many ways it was John Ehrlichman's cabinet, in that every um, domestic policy staff member, when you got to the formalized domestic policy, each person on the domestic policy staff of a certain level had a cabinet member that they liaisoned with. So um, if it was the secretary of HEW, he had to go through, and I can't remember who that would have been back in the early 70s before right. Jim Cavanaugh, but they had to go through that person in order to get to see John Earthman. So it was a very stratified system, but it worked and it worked well. Yeah, Except in the cases, pardon? I was asking Ed, Ed Harper yeah. to chime in. I would just uh, chime in to this extent that I think the written memoranda laid out, as Bobby said, is a powerful tool to discipline thought. Correct. Of everybody who's involved. So there's not a lack of clarity as to anybody's position. Because in the end, you've got to say yes or no. Or write in exactly what you would do instead. And I think uh, that was certainly in line with the president's thinking and mode of thought. Because these famous yellow tablets, he would sit down and go through and seriously look at these memoranda. And the attachments to them. And... Uh, you know, he was in some ways an intellectual or a very good lawyer at heart. That he he knew the case very well as a result of these memoranda, and I think they were a great aspect of the Nixon administration. And, and the other reason, if I may, Nixon didn't like personal salesmanship. No, he wasn't a backslapper. He he didn't think policy ought to be made because someone had a more pleasant personality. He was like a judge. He wanted to see the brief. So he could think about it. And Ed is absolutely right. It is a big effort to put something into writing to make it clear and succinct. I mean, those memos, uh, the cover memo was very short with attachments if the president wanted to learn more. But the, it, it, we used to say it took six months for a new member of the domestic council to learn how to prepare a written submission because it had to be absolutely objective. You Anybody can load a memo, but the, the, the striving on the domestic council was, was you know, Nixon didn't care what I thought. Uh, uh, what he wanted to do was, <laughs> me in particular, but he, <laughs> he, he, he wanted to understand the issue. Well, and, go ahead. Uh, I was going to say, uh, the, kind of the ultimate of an example of some of the decision papers we got was Martin Anderson, who uh, worked for Arthur Burns, uh, had office next to mine. So he and I talked a lot about policy analysis, things like that, presentation of the president. And he said, he, you know, we challenged HUD on one of its programs, the junk automobile program. Here we were spending millions of dollars to get junk cars off the streets. And let me show you what they've sent us as justification for the program. And Martin had two huge cardboard boxes in his office, <laughs> and they were filled with three-ring notebooks with photographs in it. You open the notebook, and there's a picture of a junk car parked by the curb in some metropolitan <laughs> area. Turn the page, and it's gone. That was the proof that HUD was offering as the effectiveness of the junk auto program. 
<laughs> turn the page and they're gone. <laughs> well, you, you, you need to remember, if I could, when Nixon took office, January of 1969, he was opposed by every single institution in Washington. The Congress had been in Democrat hands since the Depression. All of the congressional staff, almost all of the federal bureaucracy, all of the media, all of the law firms, you couldn't find a Republican because they'd been out of power so long. And Nixon's got all these ideas. And the question was, how on earth does he cause his his government, his executive branch, to respond? And, and the, the first issue, and it, it's put forth by the Domestic Council, uh, by, by uh, the Ash Council, is you got to have clear policy directives. But and, I don't. And, and, yeah. and you got to have inclusion on how you set them, Bobby. Right. And I was just going to say, I don't want to leave the impression that John didn't fully uh, analyze all different policy initiatives. He had lots of committees and working groups where he sat around the table with cabinet members and discussed issues. It was the final step when it went to the president, which had had to show exceptional discipline and where it had to show very clearly, this is our decision points. We're at the decision um, time, guys, and you have to decide where you're gonna go. There's also in each of those four sections that you discussed, Jeff, um, you'd have to have a pro section and a con section. So not over overall did a cabinet member have a chance in writing within this memo to say I agree or disagree, but for each section, they could give their own pros and their own cons. So the president had a broad view of, of what everybody thought. And 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 just, just to clarify, the statement of the issue Correct. is very key. Right. Is the issue that they took over the BIA building and we we got to go rush them to get them out, or is the issue how we treat how we've treated Indians for the past hundred years? Correct. And, and then you get well, why do I have to decide? Because Nixon was big on not not deciding too early. You, you know, he he only had a certain number of major decisions he was going to be making. He didn't want to waste any. And then, and then, of course, you get you, you get the full full presentation of the options. Uh, yep. Now, I want to get to to, to Kavanaugh for a second because this, I think, illustrates how influential the Domestic Council became. Jim, you told a story once that I want you to repeat. That shortly after you got there, uh, up came this issue about the war on cancer, and yes. the rest of us were staffing the State of the Union. And and uh, uh, somehow this idea reached the top very quickly. Well, it did. The president had uh, a birthday party for an old friend of his uh, by the name of Elmer Boomst. <clears throat> Elmer took him aside at the birthday party in the White House and said, uh, I just want you to know that uh, the scientific community that I come to talk to me to see me and said, there's a great opportunity to expand the knowledge that we have about the fundamental understanding of cancer, but it's going to require some from the money, and I hope you take a look at it. And with that, a note came out, and I think it went eventually to Ken Cole and sent it over to me and said, we ought to talk about this, and we did. And I said, well, I'll call Elliot Richardson, and we'll get someone from the Cancer Institute, and we'll get right on it. Uh, this was about 10 days before that year's State of the Union message, and we put together a program I uh, had outside people talking about it, inside consultation, and, and sent it up with a decision memo that you referred to, uh, Bobby, that the president had to ch take a look at and checked off what he was going to do, and he did. And uh, he made a decision that he was going to put an extra $100 million into the basic research and cancer research program. Um, help, help us for a second with Elmer Bob's position. Pardon me? What, what was Elmer Bopp's position? What was he head? What organization? Well, Elmer had a uh, number of positions. He was at one time head of the U.S. operation for Hoffmuller Roach, the pharmaceutical operation. He founded the Warner Lambert Company. He was a founding member of the American Cancer Society. Okay. Took a long interest in cancer research so, and had become a friend of the vice president when he was vice president. And that continued on to the presidency. Okay, and then I want you to, I want you to talk about your chat with Bill Sapphire. 
Well, uh, the president made his decision on, I don't know, Tuesday or Wednesday when I heard about it, saw the paper with a check off and the mark, and about two hours later, a fellow appeared at my door there at the corner of the EOB uh, uh, wing and uh, knocked and came in and said, I'm Bill Fire Sapphire. And I said, great to meet you, and I, of course, knew who he was. And he said, I'm helping the president with the State of the Union message, and he had an actual draft of it there. And he said the president would like to include something uh, about his cancer program. And I understand you're working on it. I said, I am. What would you like? He said, well, I need a paragraph or two to, to uh, fit in there. And I said, well, let me go to work on it. He said, when do you need it? He said, well, I'm, it's two o'clock now, and I'm going to see the president again at four o'clock. <laughs> I said, all right. So I got on the phone and worked with a couple of people, put together a paragraph or two, and, and uh, Bill came back and took the paragraph and said, fine. I said, now you understand that hasn't gone through any of the clearance process. He said, well, it's going to go through the only clearance process that counts when I walk across the hall. <laughs> and with that, he uh, left, and, and that was a Thursday evening. State of the Union message was going to be at 7, I think it was 9 o'clock Friday evening. The president was going to go to the Capitol and, and do it live. And uh, I did not see another draft of the uh, speech. Friday went by. Uh, I left to go back home about, I guess, 6 30, 7 o'clock. Thought, well, I better watch this address and see if by chance there's going to be any mention of it. And lo and behold, the president started at 9 o'clock. And about 9 30, he came to this section. And, and there it was the cancer program that he announced. And uh, the only the uh, next the, 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 that address was to be on the six great goals and revenue sharing and moving power from the federal establishment back to the states and to the to the communities, and that was hopefully going to be the major impact of it. The next morning, I showed up in the West Executive Avenue, parked my car, and someone showed me the headline of the New York Times atop the fold had a story about the cancer program. And I turned around and Paul O'Leal was walking across the avenue. And I said, quite a story. And he said, yeah, quite a story, quite a clearance process. <laughs> <laughs> and, and with that, we talked about it and everything <laughs> went out fine. But it, uh, it, it was a good example of how when the president has an initiative that he wants to move along, he yeah, move fairly quickly. Well, John used to lecture us as domestic council members that our job was to get the government out of the way of good ideas. That it, it, you, you'd get it tossed over to the bureaucracy and you'd never hear from it again. And, and they wanted to pick. Uh, we did roughly the same thing on uh, drug abuse treatment. I mean, we had a, a, a good idea and we ran with it and, and had full White House support on doing it. And it, it worked out rather well. Well, this was a good example of it, Jeff, because the president very strongly felt that he wanted the cancer program responsible in one person. And that one person would be appointed by the president. But he didn't want to see it lost in the bureaucracy that, that he felt that one of the things that had to be done was the goals had to be clearly set out and a program had to be identified, and the funds had to be allocated to that program. Exactly. And that's what happened. I remember one other thing about, about uh, Ehrlichman and, and his staff was uh, uh, the, the uh, uh, admonition toward creativity and new ideas. Uh, uh, and, and, and people... John was open to new ideas. Not They didn't have to come from just his own staff. And I remember one uh, instance of someone, they happened to be in congressional relations, and, and he actually hung around outside in the hallway of the second floor of the West Wing so he could run into Ehrlichman by chance. He couldn't get an appointment, but he could run into Ehrlichman by chance and share this germ of an idea. And and John was like that. John was approachable. Uh, he, he wasn't highfalutin and unduly formal or anything like that. A, a, a fine sense of humor, but 
really supported his staff, believed in his staff, and and was was looking for innovation and and uh, and different answers. Or uh, uh, Lyndon Johnson was a legislative tactician, and he'd. Uh, uh, gotten 65 bills through that constituted the great society, but lots of them were just throwing money at a problem. And in that era, uh, nobody cared who was going to get credit because the Democrats had two thirds majorities in both houses. And the committee chairman uh, wasn't elected by the committee. The committee chairman had incredible power. So you could go to see a chairman and say, look, this isn't a budget issue. You've already got $20 million you're spending on this, but we think it could be more efficient. And and the chairman had no interest in stopping that at all because it wasn't a fight over credit. If it was really a good idea, you could sell it. And that was a, it was a much happier time, Bobby. No, I was just going to say, John actually was a huge, big teddy bear. He liked people. He loved creativity. He loved inclusivity. And what Jim was talking about in the cancer war reminded me precisely what happened in Native American policy. The president had decided personally he wanted to redefine the relationship uh, between the United States government and Native American tribes. And he was going to do it. And he did do it. And everybody on the domestic policy or the, yes, domestic policy staff kind of laughed at it a little bit. And at the 730 meetings, they would say, oh, you know, what are you going to do now? What are you going to do now? But the day after the president had the Taos Pueblo people in the cabinet room to present his native new Native American policy, it was the next morning above the fold on the first page of the New York Times and said, Richard Nixon redefines Native American policy. And the one person, two people who believed in it, in addition to the president, were John and Len Garment and me, obviously. But um, the president said, run with it. He took a lot of rest, risks. He had the senator from New Mexico, senior Senator Clinton Anderson, um, who was a piece of work, say he was going to vote against the anti-ballistic missile treaty if we dare return Blue Lake to the Taos Pueblo people. And I, it's not printable, nor is it sayable <laughs> on a public forum, but uh, the president said, you go tell Clinton Anderson to go himself because we're going to do this because it's right. And so thinking outside the box and being creative was one of John's really big suits. I, I'm going to focus on this, Bobby, because I've heard the story, but I, I want it told again. We Indians were considered to be separate nations, and we had treaties Correct. with the Indians. Correct. And and these treaties hung over, and, and they were inconvenient because we'd given them oil land and, and lots of land and all, all kinds of other things. So what had been the policy before Nixon was called assimilation. That's right. We were going to get rid of the Indian problem by paying them to leave their rights sell their birthright, uh, move out of the treaty, and get some money to go into the center city and live in the slums of a, of a big city and become assimilated in the rest of society. And this was federal policy. Yes. And, and Nixon came, helped by Bobby, but Nick, I, I accused her of majoring in Indian affairs at Yale Law School. <laughs> but, but Nixon said, no, no, we can't do that to these people. They they have treaty rights that are to be treated with respect. And he reversed that policy, which was which was not only correct, but astounding in retrospect that it had been pursued. Absolutely astounding. And it was a policy of self-determination rather than termination or assimilation. And you still, to, to this day, if you go up to Taos and you go into the... Uh, Kivas and you go into the homes of the uh, on the uh, Pueblo, you will see photos of Richard Nixon on their mantelpieces because they have such a continue to have such a respect for what he did. Um, and he changed the direction of a major, major um, hundreds of years of, of destruction uh, to do something right because he knew it was right. And he didn't care what anybody else thought. He was going to do it, and he did it. 
uh, I, I would add, he, he always he always spoke about his uh, football coach at college. Yes, his I went football to coach in college. Many times. Yes, uh, was Coach uh, Newman. A guy named from Chief the... Newman. And Chief, he was yeah, Chief and Newman from the yeah, he would have he, he would have coached at a major university if he Correct. but for the fact of discrimination against Indians. Yeah, and, and, and he thought really that was very. Unfair. They had lots of papers by and about Newman. Yeah, that was so intriguing. He was a huge influence on on uh, ten years of football players. Nixon was too slight of build <laughs> to make the team. He never stopped trying. I mean, he fought like mad, but he wasn't physically strong enough. So he managed. But he always talk about Newman and the inspiration and the lectures and all this kind of stuff. And what came through to me when I was when I was doing this work, and this was years later after I left the White House, Chief Newman didn't remember him. He he had coached a lot of kids and and been a big influence on their lives. But you know, after the first three hundred students, they they all meshed together. But he never once took credit for being that kind of influence on Nixon. He would speak in general terms, and he wasn't eager to to tell people he couldn't remember him, but he wasn't going to claim credit <laughs> for recognizing him early on. I mean, that takes a lot of stature when yeah. the president is going on and on and on about how influential you were, and you're not going, oh, aw, shucks, you know, it was really nothing, I knew him. And it was it was a, a, a tribute to his stature. I want to switch, because we, we, we didn't, practice this. Yeah, can I make just one quick point, and then I'll sure. let you switch, and that is that uh, the president really did believe in self-determination, and if you draw a parallel to historically black universities, the president put a lot of money into historically black colleges because he believed that not everybody had to fit into the same mold, and that you needed to respect differences, and so again, it was the concept of self-determination and integration, but not forced assimilation. And he carried that over to higher education when he really and, put his, ma- we're gonna his money where his mouth was. We're going to circle back to that when we get to LMB, because that was yeah. George Schultz's proudest accomplishments. Right. But I want to focus on the environment. Uh, John John was a land use lawyer in a, in a <laughs> uh, firm in Seattle uh, when he wasn't helping the president to campaign. Remember, John was in the campaign. None of us were. Uh, but uh, uh, the the oh Bill okay oh, I didn't know well ah, we'll get to you in just a second let me let me finish my thought on the environment before I forget it John was huge on the environment and it was a budding issue it was not huge it wasn't in the campaign uh, it, it it you know it was Rachel whatever Silent Spring and the first Earth Day. But we take today huge credit for the administration being so enlightened on on, on the environment. And, and from my viewpoint, it was all John. It was John who pushed the president, John who made made the points. I, I don't think any of us worked <laughs> on that, though. Did Jim, Ed? No, I watched it. I, I saw what John Whitaker was doing on the staff side. Yeah, Whitaker was the one who was in charge of the staffing of it. Right. Uh, and uh, Todd Holland worked for him in that area, and so did uh, Ed, the other White House fellow. We are trying to get his name earlier. Um, um, he came from uh, 3M. Meet guy. Oh, Judd Dixon? No, no, mm-hmm. that was IBM. Oh, I'm- uh, See, all these fellows pass in the... <laughs> No, I, I know uh, what you mean. I, I'm not sure his name was Ed, but I know. Well, yeah. maybe not. His wife's name was Gay. I remember that. Yes. I would see him at all the reunions, all the fellows' yes. reunions. He became ultimately vice chairman of uh, Minnesota Mining and he Manufacturing. Did. Yeah. Uh, and he, 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 he did the environment. But we there was a huge amount of environmental legislation, not just creation of EPA. But the clean air, clean water, marine mammal, anti-ocean dumping, uh, the, the creation of NOAA was every bit as in, influential in the environment as, as EPA. Okay, uh, we're, we, we've been holding off of the complement of OMB. And, and what I'd like to do is have AV put up the slide on the OMB management. There we go. And the first 
director of OMB is George Schultz, who came over from the Department of Labor. And his, if you drop down to deputy directors, his deputy director was Cap Weinberger, followed by Fred Malik and then Paul O'Neill. Uh, and I, I really want to focus on those four uh, uh, because I think they set the tone. And, and you, you remember what happened. Uh, the domestic council was supposed to help the president to set the policy, the president's decisions. But then OMB was supposed to effectuate it. And it was called in the Ash Council memos, the Office of Executive Management. But the decision was made, if you were going to transform the Bureau of the Budget, you needed to keep the name budget. And they said afterwards, we take the slide down, go back to the full screen now. They said afterwards that it was the money that OMB controlled that gave that agency their slack, their, their, their swack. I mean, they you, know, you talk management to you are blue in the face, but when you're withholding funds until certain things happen, it gets people's attention. So let's let's go, if we could, first to Ed Harper on the the uh, the idea of of Office of Management and Budget, and then to Bill Kilberg on George Schultz as a manager. Well, the uh, Office of Management and Budget uh, was seen, I think, by the people from the Bureau of the Budget as, well, this is one more incarnation of the Bureau of the Budget. It's kind of expanded and recognized something that we did at the uh, Bureau of the Budget, and that is we have big influence on management. And so they weren't too unhappy with the role because they knew whatever else happened, it was still going to be the president's mark generated through a fairly traditional process, but it was the domestic council working with the Office of Management and Budget coming up with that mark. And and, and they had, a, a, this isn't rehearsed, so we got to be careful. There was a guy whose only job was the budget, the federal budget. Sam Cohn, he's, Sam was they, the made, they banned Michael. smoking in the office building so he would eat cigars, <laughs> chew on them, and, yep. and, and they, would, they would rank the intensity of the debate over the money by whether it was a three-cigar meeting or a four-cigar <laughs> meeting. Sam would sit there and, and, and chew. He couldn't smoke it. He chewed. He spit out, you know, parts of the uh, of the cigar, but he was the, uh, I think, the acknowledged expert. Absolutely. And then there really was an office of executive management in the old BOB. And remember, that was run by Dwight Inc. Yeah. Now I don't think it had nearly the influence that the agency had, but the the agency was pretty much the cream of the civil service crop. And we got that. I mean, those were top people. They they were. They were absolutely top people. Tremendous experience. And <laughs> even though some people on the domestic council and the White House staff questioned their loyalty, I worked with them all the time, and I didn't because I saw that they were really implementing the president's program. I mean, Dwight Inc., he still says the greatest accomplishment he ever had was getting rid of the new communities program. <laughs> and of course he had played a role in birthing yeah. it in the first place. There was, there was this, this great quote. I think it came from Paul O'Neill who said, if the president wants a pig on every porch at three o'clock in the afternoon, every day, our job is to figure out how to do it. And, and that was kind of how the OMB people saw their, their role. Bill, let's go to you and talk about George Schultz and his management style. Happy to do it. Uh, I would note that, um, and first off, I'm one of many mentees of George Schultz. He, he mentored a lot of folks during his, uh, his very lengthy and distinguished career. Uh, I think it's important to note that George and John Ehrlichman got along very, very well. Uh, had a mutual respect, liked each other. I'm the uh, beneficiary of a, uh, of a gift from John Ehrlichman some years ago where he gave me a copy of a 
sketch he had done. John used to, you know, John drew a lot. He sketched while at meetings. And he had a meeting, uh, one meeting with George Schultz in Schultz's office. Schultz had a, a clock on his wall, an old clock. And John sketched the clock. And uh, knowing my relationship to George, he gave it to me as a, uh, as a gift so many years ago, which I have framed and, and still cherish. So they had a very, very good relationship. I think Schultz would say that in terms of his professional life, he was most influenced by two sets of experiences, one in the United States Marine Corps and the other as an economist, dean of the Chicago Business School, labor arbitrator and mediator. The, the, those kind of all go together. Uh, on the Marine Corps side, you saw it. In, in, Schultz was very soft-spoken. He had a very strong sense of right and wrong, and he would express his views very calmly. You had to listen to him very, very carefully. Uh, there were, as he said, no empty threats. He used to say empty bluffs are not a good idea. He carried over later to a new Secretary of State, but in all of his roles, Schultz was very down-to-earth and very soft-spoken, but very clear and very brief. He had a view of the federal bureaucracy. He said they're not to be feared, but they are to be led. Uh, he did not believe in big staffs. Uh, he used to say that the people who are the line organization are my staff. So at the Labor Department, it was the assistant secretaries. Uh, at OMB, it would be the associate directors. He let them structure their organizations in a way, again, quoting from him, that he said was suitable to them so long as it's also suitable to me. Uh, he had not, didn't believe in too many direct reports. This was something he did at labor very early on. He took over from, from Bill Wirtz, uh, who had been, uh, Willard Wirtz, who'd been Secretary of Labor in, in the Johnson administration. Uh, Schultz and Wirtz were good friends. Uh, they'd known each other for many years. Wirtz had taught at the University of Chicago Law School. They had worked together across uh, business school, law school lines. Uh, but he had a very different view of things than Wirtz did. And he streamlined, reorganized the department and streamlined it so that there were much, many fewer direct reports to the, to the secretary. Schultz was not political. Uh, he got criticized in the early days at labor because so many of his appointees were Democrats. Jim Hodson, his, his deputy secretary, had been a Democrat. Uh, Libby Coons, who headed the, the Women's Bureau. Jeff Moore, who was an independent but not a Republican. Uh, Arnie Weber, uh, who'd been his assistant secretary for um, manpower and came with Schultz over to uh, OMB to, to, to head the management side. Uh, we're all Democrats. One of the reasons that Larry Silverman got to the position he did as solicitor uh, at a very young age uh, was because Larry was a Republican and one of very, very few. Schultz didn't look at political or you know political party, but he did look at ideology. He was very, very close to Arthur Burns. He had worked for Burns in the Eisenhower administration on the Council of Economic Advisors. And he had been very close to Milton Friedman. And Schultz used to say proudly that I'm a Friedmanite. Under his breath, sometimes he would say, not a Friedmaniac, but I am a Friedman. <laughs> that was also his, his sense of humor. Uh, and he had a great faith in markets. And that, that leads me to the discussion of his, his training at MIT as an economist and his work as an economist. Schultz was, a, like the president, thought in terms of strategy. And he always gave that credit to his being an economist. He said, as an economist, I understand that there's lag time. You do something, but it doesn't happen right away. There's a lag time. You have to be thinking in advance. You have to be thinking in strategic terms, in large terms. And when he became secretary in January of uh, 1969, we had a longshore strike going on in the United States on the East Coast 
and on uh, the Gulf Coast. And Schultz would tell this story many, many times as an example of strategic thinking. The Johnson administration had issued, had issued a Taft-Hartley injunction. The injunction had been challenged by the unions, gone all the way up on a fast track to the uh, Supreme uh, Court. Uh, let me interrupt and just explain what the cooling-off period is. It's an 80-day cooling-off period. And uh, the president has the statute. authority to do that. He has the authority to do it if he can show that there's a national emergency. He has to go to court to show there's a national emergency. And it's and renewable one time? It's renewable one time. It had ex it expired uh, a few days before Schultz became secretary on January 21st, 1969. So the administration was faced with this strike now taking place. It had been held up because of the injunctions and it was now going to, the injunctions were off and the strike was going to occur. And there's a lot of media pressure on the president, a lot of political pressure on the president. Take action, bring them into the White House, get legislation if you need to. We can't have this strike. It's a national emergency. Schultz went to see President Nixon and he said the Supreme Court is wrong. The Johnson administration was wrong. It is not a national emergency. It's a serious inconvenience. There's going to be some economic effects, but it is not a national emergency. If we bring these folks into the White House, if we force a settlement, it says you will be hanging out your shingle and saying, come here. He said nobody will, in any major industry, will bargain in good faith. They'll all hold back their final offer, their best offer, until they get to the White House. He said, we need to encourage the market to work, the parties to solve their own problem. The president supported him, took a lot of heat for it, supported Schultz. They did not bring the unions into the White House. They didn't do anything. They said, go ahead and bargain. A few weeks later, the strike was settled. There was never a national emergency. And Schultz would always point to that. He would point to, to uh, other examples uh, out of his background. He would talk about the Hawthorne, Hawthorne experiment. Hawthorne was a, a general electric plant uh, in Hawthorne, New York, and where an experiment was done. They found that if they increased the lighting in the plant, productivity improved. Then they found that if they took the lighting out that they had put in, productivity improved further. And Schultz said this was because, I mean, they said, but Schultz always cited this example, that somebody was paying attention to the workers. Yeah. And Schultz took that as a lesson that you should listen. He said, listen to what the other side has to say. Listen carefully. He said also he, would, he believed that people like to learn. He said, so... Let's engage in a learning exercise. And he used that very effectively when the president asked him to uh, head a, a, an effort on desegregation of Southern schools. This is, this is while he was at OMB. And he had to deal with uh, governors from the Southern states. Uh, and you remember, this is 1969, 1970. Yeah. Uh, and we still had segregated schools since you know the, the 1954 Brown decision hadn't changed a whole heck of a lot. Uh, and Schultz got the confidence of all of the players because they recognized that he was listening, hearing what they had to say, responding and educating on what the administration was prepared to do, what had to be done. He delivered a strong message, as only a former Marine could do it. It was uh, one of uh, Schultz's proudest accomplishments, was yes. the peaceful desegregation of the Southern schools. And they, yes. we have a program, we have a Nixon Legacy program on it featuring George. And, and, and they said, <clears throat> we brought in the leadership in the Southern states, individual states, and said, look, it's going to happen. You can do it easy or you can do it, you can do it uh, rough, but it's going to happen. <clears throat> and you're going to rue the day when you could have done it 
peacefully and you didn't take advantage of it. And by the way, we have some money for you here if you do it our way, because he had an OMB. <clears throat> I think what they did was buy buses, but I'm not, I'm not, I'm not. Not positive. Now, let me switch among, just for among a second. Other things. Let me mention one other thing in that. No, go ahead. That, that Schultz used to talk about, George would talk about a great deal. While he was in the labor relations world as dean of the, of, of the School of Business at the University of Chicago, he uh, co-chaired with Clark Kerr a automation committee uh, for the Armour Meat Company dealing with displacement of workers as a result of automation. They had to go to a plant in Fort Worth, Texas. An executive from Armour was African-American. They went to check into a hotel. Schultz checked in, Clark Kerr checked in. This fellow went to check in. They said, I'm sorry, we have no more rooms. Schultz said, well, that's all right. He could stay in my room. And the, the desk clerk uh, objected to that. And Schultz put his foot down. He says, you have more rooms and you're going to find this gentleman a room. He says, well, we're all leaving. Schultz always pointed to that, not, not in terms of the, the pride he legitimately could take in his own actions, but as kind of a rude awakening on um, race relations in the United States. And it, it, it was instrumental in the views he developed with regard to affirmative action, the Philadelphia plan when he was Secretary of Labor, uh, and his actions and his activities with regard to desegregation of schools. Yeah, it was one of the stories you could often tell. Let's clarify that just for a second. It wasn't just desegregation of the southern schools. The Philadelphia plan was desegregation of the northern trade unions. Right. Labor and, and the, the continuation of that because it the the discrimination wasn't just in the south. Oh, that's right. It was it was it was in the construction trades, skilled trades throughout the United States. And when Schultz testified in Congress and he was asked about imposing a quota uh, for the employment of, of black workers in the construction trades. He said, no, he said, I'm removing a quota. He says, right now there's a quota of zero. You know, and my effort yeah. is to get rid of that quota. Your, uh, your comment about Hawthorne, the Hawthorne experiment, reminds me of something that Don Rumsfeld said. Maybe you guys ran into this years ago. He said, whatever you measure." will improve. You just have to, unless you measure everything, <clears throat> you just have to be sure you're measuring the right thing. Because if you're measuring the, the, the tons of waste coming out of a plant, that will improve. The product may not be safe or something else may not work right. But you need to be very careful when you start measuring stuff. Yeah. All right, now, uh, I, I want to make an, a, a point on Numbers of people. Then I want to go back to Jim on uh, on his appearance before the Congress. Uh, I don't have the early headcount, but I have come across a 1971 press release from the Nixon White House, April of 1971, that lists all the members of the White House staff, all the members of the National Security Council, and all the members of the Domestic Council. And I think it's very instructive because there are 128 members of the White House staff, congressional relations, speech writers, advanced teams, uh, all, and the first lady staff, just all kinds of people, names that we all remember from the glory days. And there's the list of people from the National Security Council uh, that I don't remember because I worked on domestic affairs. But there's 128 on the White House staff. There's... 55 on the national security staff and there's 19 on the domestic council. Wow. 19. And it's, it's because we were supposed to help John and Ken, but the president to decide upon the policy 
and then it was we were supposed to follow through, but OMB was supposed to execute. Now, I didn't come up with a phone directory or a, a, a list of people from OMB, but of course, it was huge. It was a big, big agency. Now, Jim, uh, having said that we never testified, we were, we were the president's private army, uh, you had an exception. I did. Um, I mentioned earlier the cancer program the president had as one of his priorities. We were working on differences of the program between the House and Senate version. The Senate was in the committee that Ted Kennedy chaired. The House version was in a committee that Paul Rogers, a congressman from Florida, chaired, who was quite interested in health and programs and legislation. And I had worked with Congressman Rogers and Anchor Nelson, a Republican member from Minnesota, to collaborate on what the president would wanted in his final legislative package. And he wanted to get it done that year in the legislation. We were in now early December. And uh, I thought I had it pretty well agreed with the House. And I was having lunch in the White House mess one day. And the phone rang and my secretary said, uh, Congressman Rogers on the phone. And I said, well, I'm sitting around some people. Can I call him back? She said, he wants to talk to you right now. If, if you want your legislation, today's the day and you need to talk to him. So I said, what can I do for you? He said, we're in executive session. We're getting ready at four o'clock to go meet our counterparts from the Senate. Ted Kennedy's got some things that he wants that none of us agree with, but I need some help to what the president would agree to. He said, you got to come up and meet with the Republican members. He said, I'll, I'll, I'll promise you there'll be no transcript. It'll be an executive session. So I said, all right. And flashed through my mind, executive privilege, Watergate was going on. You know, people were not going up to testify. And I just decided we were going to get this legislation. And I, I knew Rogers enough that if he said he was going to keep a confidential, he would. So I said, I'll be up. I hung up the phone went around the corner of the motor pool, said, I don't want to go up to the house. He gave me the number of the house the mm -hmm. conference room over in the uh, house side. I went in, they had the whole committee there. He said, I, just, I promised you, we're going to keep this in executive session and keep it between us. But we've got seven points that we need to go down through. And he said, my members will hold firm if we sure the president's behind you. So we went through point by point. I gave him what the president's position was. He said, we've got just what we need. We'll go over and wish us well. Let us see what we can do. So they went over and had their meeting. He called me up later and said all the Senate succeeded to all what we wanted to do. And with that, they passed out the bill the following week. And I think it was December 23rd of 1971 in the East Room, the president signed it. So we, we call that back channel. <laughs> Back channel communication. Back channel for sure. But you can imagine what was going on with with Watergate and executive privilege. And Congress wanted to get certain members of the White House up to testify how we were. And what went through my mind is, do I call Bill Timmons and talk to him about it? Or do I call the counsel's office? Well, I knew in a minute that if I had done that, um, the answer probably would have been, well, let's talk about it. Let's think about it. And as I said, I had the confidence that Paul Rogers and Anchor Nelson both were dealing with a straight deck and they, they wanted this legislation passed. And, uh, and so that's what happened. And so it came to be. <clears throat> well, you, you said the magic word. You said Watergate. Uh, uh, I uh, was uh, intimately involved in the president's defense uh, and I've done a lot of research on the special prosecutor's materials since, and I wrote three books, and I'm, I'm, uh, it's, it's my, uh, my obsession. Uh, I really like, liked, because he's passed away, John Ehrlichman. Uh, I just thought the world of him. Um, and I don't think anybody got shafted worse than John. Uh, in in the uh, in the issue, uh, he wasn't in the chain of command. He did not do anything uh, demonstrably evil. 
uh, and it just ruined everything. I mean, it it uh, it ruined his life. It ruined his marriage. It ruined his relationship with his kids. Uh, I I, uh, um, I I I really worry about that because I don't think uh, anything close to justice was done. I'm very biased in this, and this isn't the place to debate this, but I I think the one who was most at fault, there was a break-in, the break-in people were going to get punished, no, no, not worry about that, <clears throat> but the, the one who ran the cover-up, I think, to protect himself when it collapsed, and it should have collapsed, then pointed the finger at others who the Congress and the and the uh, uh, press was were, were bigger fish, and John's uh, uh, difficulty was that he was the bigger fish. Bobby, do you have more to say? Well, I was just going to say that you're absolutely right. And going back again to Native Americans, the Native American community was so grateful to John for what he had done in redefining uh, Indian relations that they went to the judge, the, the 15 tribes of the Taos, of the uh, New Mexico Pueblos, went to the judge and asked the judge if John could please, instead of serving time in prison, could please do community service um, for the Pueblos. The judge said no, but John was just so overwhelmed by that, that after some long discussions that, that Bill and I and he had, um, he decided to move with his wife, Christy, uh, to New Mexico, and they moved to Santa Fe, and we got to know him even better as a friend over oh, 15, 20 years. And he immersed himself in the community. He continued to work with the Pueblos on environmental issues, on legal rights issues, on water rights issues. And um, he did have a, a second marriage to Christy. He did have a wonderful young son in Michael, who was the same age as my children were, who is now, my goodness, some of in his early 40s. Um, he reconciled with his own kids, and he died way too young at age 73 in Atlanta. But I know deep in his heart that his respect for Richard Nixon for the initiatives that Richard Nixon believed in and that he believed in and that which Richard Nixon enabled him to push, for, he, John Erlewin, to push forward is something that was obviously the central part of his life. And so I guess we're near to closing. I just want to say that to me, John Erlewin had a profound effect on my life and I hope on the life of everyone else because he was just an extraordinary individual. And I'll tell you one last, I know you're sick and tired of hearing about Indians, but I'll tell you one last Indian story because it um, emphasized the role of OMB and George Schultz in relationship to domestic council and the kind of deference they needed to show us. Two story, quick stories. One, there were two assistant directors of OMB who hated the Native American policy, knew Native American policy and were determined to undercut it. And they did everything they could budget wise and structurally to just deep six it. And finally their boss, Don Rice, came over and saw me and said, Bobby, this was the president's initiative. We are not going to stand in this way. And I've told these two guys to stand down and shut up. That was number one. Number two, in the spring of 1971, there was the Alaska Native Land Claim Settlement Act, which would provide 44.5 million acres of land back to the Alaska Natives, as well as $962 million in cash through a royalty system. $962 million in cash was real money back then. And um, the president had called Ehrlichman and just Ehrlichman into the old oil office. And he said, well, I don't know. Well, John says he called him into the Oval office. And he said, I want this to be settled. I want it to be settled now and fairly. Uh, and I need to get the Alaskan pipeline built, and I can't do it until we solve this, so we're going to solve it and going to solve it justly. Ehrlichman called into his office um, Roger Morton, who was Secretary of the Interior, George Schultz, uh, myself, uh, Don Rice, uh, Brad Patterson, and said, this is what the president wants to do. 
Do any of you have any objections? And nobody, not a single person in that room had a single objection, though no less than two hours before that, Roger Morton had me on the phone screaming at me about what a terrible possible settlement this was and how the president should never be part of it. But as soon as John said, this is what the president wants, uh, that was it. There's no more yeah, discussion. What, what, what's unique is... John didn't have to say it very often, but when John said it, it was true. That's right. We and well, I'm right. not even sure that John, I asked John after that, I said, John, did you really go and ask the president? And he had this twinkle in his eye and he said, for me to know and you to think, um, it didn't matter. John was the president in this sense. And when John said something, everybody knew that that was what the decision had been made and that was what we were going to do. And it was the Domestic Policy Council that was ruling. Okay, we've got we got about ten minutes left. <clears throat> Our uh, uh, Na NASA uh, NARA people, Tom, can you feed me questions? I don't see them on my screen. Ah, there's one. There have been no questions so far from the audience, so <laughs> I'm, I'm going to add something at this point. Thank you, Tom. Uh, I've done reunions of the policy planning staff. None of us, except Bill somehow, snuck into the campaign. But none of us uh, uh, were, were campaigners. We were people who helped to govern. And it's it, people who do well in the campaign aren't necessarily qualified to help run the executive branch. Uh, uh, and, and so the reunions I have, and I was in law school, uh, like Bobby and Bill, so I was not involved in the campaign. Uh, and, and so I remember as as my closest colleagues and, and uh, friends, people from the Domestic Council and people from the uh, uh, Office of Presidential Appointees to OMB, and, and by default, some people from the National Security Council who were keeping us all safe. So I've been hosting annual reunions of what we call the White House policy planning staff uh, uh, for almost 40 years. We're the only White House staff that has regularly scheduled annual reunions of the governance people. And uh, we'll make, make a possible exception for the NSC people. But I think to a single person, everybody in that reunion group would say that John Ehrlichman was the one they liked the most uh, that felt that they felt treated people fairly uh, more so than and, and was most approachable than anybody else. We, the, the proud, the few, we band of brothers, including Bobby, uh, we had the best jobs in the world. It was fun to come to work. They were tough issues. But John understood the, the, the lawyer's admonition that lawyers work with each other. They don't work for each other. Uh, and that was very clear in the domestic council work. And John wasn't afraid of letting you sign your own memo and get credit for your own research. I mean, he may have the cover memo, but if you wrote the definitive memo, it went in with your name on it. And that was unique on the White House staff, too. Now we're going to, in the last six minutes, we're going to go ring around the rosy and get final thoughts from uh, from each of you, if you care to contribute. Uh, and we're going to start with uh, Bobby because she's the most articulate. Yeah. Um, it was an honor and a privilege to serve in the Nixon administration, to serve for President Nixon, and especially to work for and with, with John Ehrlichman. Um, I love you, John. We always will. Thank you. Bill, you follow your wife? Follow my wife. Um, but I would second everything she said in that uh, because I'm a, a great admirer of John Ehrlichman as well. Uh, and a great admirer, of course, of, uh, of George Schultz, who uh, played such a large role in my, in my career. Just as a footnote, uh, because I did work on the campaign, uh, I worked with people who came into the administration. I worked on the research staff, so there was, I was the gopher for Pat Buchanan, Bill Sapphire, uh, Alan Greenspan, Martin Anderson, uh, the whole crew of uh, really exceptional 
people who uh, who did come into the administration in a variety of, of positions. Uh, I was the guy that uh, went to the library and did the research for them, but that allowed them to write the position papers and speeches and so on that they did for the president during the campaign. I wasn't the only one, uh, but I was certainly one of one of the gophers. Go to Jim. Well, I didn't uh, work directly with John. I saw not a lot of them, but I had great respect for the organization he put together and people that he had, namely in his deputy, Ken Cole, who I worked with daily and some days hourly on key issues. And, and, and John uh, kept to his word. He delegated to Ken what, it, what Ken was going to do in the health area. And uh, Ken was just a superb guy to work with and a great member of the president's staff. It doesn't get mentioned a lot, but I just thought the world of him thought he was a great member of the staff. And it was a privilege to work with him and all of the people on this call. Thank you, Ed. We're going to let you have final word. Thank you. That uh, I echo Bobby's thoughts about John Ehrlichman as a man who was a great man and uh, had great love for other people. And I think many people loved him for all the things that he stood for. And it reminded me, Bobby's talking about uh, John's time in New Mexico, that uh, Lucy and I visited him and his wife there at their home. And uh, he said, you see this big picture window and the picture window kind of looked around a tree and you could see this beautiful valley of uh, uh, the town and great expanse of New Mexico. And I said, uh, I guess that was a tough decision, John, not to take that tree out so you get an advantage of full view. And he said, no, <laughs> he said, it was an easy decision that I talked when we we're looking at the house and thinking about buying it. I talked to a guy and he said, you know, how much will you charge me to take that tree out? And he said, I don't think you're going to want to do that. The tree's 350 years old. Wow. And it was only about six feet high. Passed <laughs> <laughs> in New Mexico. He said, no, we got to leave it there. <laughs> well, that's super. That's I think in, in, in retrospect, I looked through all these names when I was helping prepare for this. It was a time of giants. I mean, yeah. the, the Nixon people brought in really toweringly professional, effective people. They had great leadership, uh, not not just uh, uh, John and, and and George, but he, he, even even the president himself. He was uh, uh, he, he wanted to do the right thing. He felt very strongly about stuff. Uh, he was leading us. He wasn't sitting there waiting. Her proposals. I think he would get up every day and say, we're, we, we are wasting time if we're not moving forward. So I want to thank you, the panel participants, for, for joining us for this. I want to thank the, the, the NARA people, uh, Tom Nasdaq and his crew, for helping to staff us. And uh, we bid our, our audience, uh, now and in the future, uh, a good day. The documents we have alluded to at some point will be available and we'll put the links up with the uh, posting of this video. It's a project that's ongoing, but we'll, we will do that uh, when we move into the future. So thank you all and to all a good night. Happy.